Hey everybody, welcome to Style Maiden on the Mix Files. Um, my name is June Decay, and today we're doing an episode on the Knox. Um, super excited um, to talk about them. We have a lot to cover, so let's get right into it. Usually when we look at the Knox, we see um, the biggest kind of like immediate identifier of the Maiden, the Knox Maiden, the Knox Swordstress is the Henin. And there's actually a little bit of, of mystery with the name itself, but uh, typically that's what people know it as. Um, and in the game, it's, we call it's just crown, nor, nor, not swords, just crown, and knight, main and twin crown. Um, underneath it, though, we have a hood, um, or we have a hood that's kind of like a head wrap. Um, it could be any number of kind of the cloth, could be a uh, gorget, could be. It's not really a chin strap, um, but it's covering the hair, covering the face. Um, for the uh, for the maidens and the swordstresses, it's covering the eyes, and for um, the uh, the Knox monk, it's covering the mouth. When we look at this piece, though, we can tell that there's a lot of work put into it. Um, but you know, if you are not super into fashion history, or even if you are. You, maybe this is not the era that you're in. Uh, I definitely was not super knowledgeable in this area until I started researching. Um, you'll find a lot of arguments in the construction of the Henin. Um, so let's go look at that. The name itself is actually, um, has a lot of debate as well. Henin's only shown once, or written once, um, and it's written in about 30 years um, before um the this prince the, you know what we kind of know as the princess uh conical shape of uh, so you'll see a lot of different representations of the henin across history um these are a couple of portraits um this the woman on the right is maria potinati um and this is another portrait i forget the woman on the left um these are from manuscripts and then these are more, and I say modern, but they're still uh, like not modern 2020s versions of what we thought the Henin would look like or what we kind of could think about the construction of the Henin. And so typically when you see the Henin nowadays, it is a dunce cone basically with a veil on the back. Um, that is typically how you see it, and you'll you'll see sometimes the double henin version. Um, yeah, so this is more of an Escofian. Um, so then these have like the little braids on them. So not what we're looking for. Not definitely what we're trying to get. We know that this is closer to what we're having, um, and this one too, right? Um, but how are they made? Previously, again, we thought it was just like one big piece. But when you look at these pieces, you realize that it's multiple pieces. And so we have a veil coming out of this hood part. And if this was one piece, that wouldn't have happened. This veil would not have gone through if it was just one. Um, so you have this hood, something hold, creating the truncated, truncated cone shape, and then a veil put on top of that so that it can be fitted. And so here, it's hard to see because of the black, but you can see that there's the hood and then there's a possibly new piece of fabric right here that's made and then the cone sticking out. What people, um, so I was watching a video, uh, the Countess, uh, no, the creative Contessa, um, what she was saying is that she believes that the hood got cut so um, if you remember my um, uh, Renala video or my Ryan Lucaria video, um, the Lyra pipe is at the edge of a lot of hoods. So what most likely happens is that Lyra pipe probably got cut and then the, the cone piece was pulled out and then made into a design. So then from there, possibly wrapped, depending on how you were creating it. And during this era, too, there are going to be different types of construction methods because this isn't the internet age. And people who are making these are in different countries, they're in different cities, different states. Um, so they have, they're either having to figure it out on their own or they are looking at 
images and going, okay, well, I'm going to have to make it that way. But typically, again, the henin was mostly for noble women. Um, so I do think that's part of the reason why we see it on um, the uh, the knots is just to, you know, they, they're, they're higher stature. So this is relevant because they took the time to look at the crafting methods of the henin. Um, you can see that this is following more modern perspectives on how the henin was crafted. This is not merely one single piece that is coming out of the head. This is multiple pieces. Um, so instead of a black fabric, we have these kind of like metal parts that are being used to kind of keep the trunk, the cone um, going um, and staying. And then two, what I love is that there's this construction method with the circlet, with the metal circlet that's on the top of it that is keeping the hood on while keeping the tail going. I love that. I think that's, there's so much detail to that. Um, and also too, if you notice this, it almost looks like an eye and uh, this metal oval. Um, that I believe is mirroring this part right here. Um, so some people, if some books I read from the 1960s and 70s, they were saying like it was a hair. Um, and it, maybe some people thought it was. Um, but the Countess, the create, I want to call her the Countess Contessa, the creative Contessa uh, was, is thinking this was a part of the hood to keep it on. So again, you have these little things, um, to just keep it on, just to keep it on. That's all. Um, but again, probably different methods. There's probably different ways this is being made over history. But one of the other things that is really interesting too, is that these veils are a lot more translucent than the Knox ones. And I, I assume that has to do with um, their desire to like, it's like, no, we want, our eyes are veiled. We are monastic. We have our, our agreements to, for our beliefs, yada, yada. Um, and just something to add to, I think that's really interesting is that this does remind me a little bit of the Renato design as well, this little metal piece. Um, and we do see zigzags, um, in Norman um, uh, architecture, in Romanesque architecture and design. Um, and where is it on um, Well, let's get into it. When you're looking at the outfit, the armor set of the Knox Swordstress, the Knox Night Maiden, the outstanding features are the breastplate area, this like vest kind of thing, these silk capes that can come off, this really high fantasy looking um, neck piece, and then the sleeves, the sleeves, the sleeves, the sleeves, and then also the 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 beaded belt. <clears throat> They really kind of define the silhouette and the style of the Knox. Um, we can even see, um, while she, the big lady doesn't have the same sleeve as they do, it's still a big one. Um, so long sleeves, important. Um, and when you look for a similar historical outfit it becomes very challenging to find something because you get you have the understanding but this is very high fantasy um there's armor mixed with ecclesiastical dress but what is the other missing ingredient and to me it's the blio now what is the blio the blio you have seen a thousand times it is an iconic piece of art um, that very much finds our um, way through our modern perception via pre-Raphaelite art. And so you get a lot of paintings of the Blio. Um, and so I looked into it and I was like, okay, well, where is this coming from? Okay, okay, it's this, this is 12th century fashion. This is about the Normans. Now, the Normans. The Normans are um, coming into power in the, 11th, the 12th century um, in terms of taking over, I think, Britain area was now what we now know as Britain. 
Um, there's other areas, I think Italy, or what we now know is Italy. Um, and there's a few other areas that they were taking over. Um, but they were carrying kind of the Roman, um, so they had their own fashion. Um, our men's fashion actually gets written about a lot because priests hated it. They thought it was too feminine, um, which makes no sense since everybody was wearing tunics. Um, and I wonder, sometimes I wonder too, if they, if I read that because of the, the source itself thinks that, or if it was something that they actually found, but eh, not here nor there. Um, but allegedly we have less fashion of the women. Now, these two images on the left are um, cool because I got them from my own book. So the way that I kind of got to this theory was I have a, a book of fashion from the 1970s. So I have, a, you know, this fashion book that's out of print um, and has some images that don't get shown online. Um, and so I saw these and I thought, oh, wow, those are really, really close to what the Knox are wearing, but they're like dresses. So I'm like, well, that can't really be it because it's like not a two piece. But I was like, this feels really close. I'm like, their hair is not the same. These images are attempts at understanding what the blio was and how it was constructed throughout history. And so what we find in the blio is a long standing debate on its construction methods. And why does that all matter? Because I think it's being expressed in the Knox's fashion. So the Blio, this is probably um, one of the closer ones to what we have. We know we see a blue out, Blio as, um, granted, Blio is in the 19th century. It existed for a long time. There's going to be a lot of different versions naturally anyways. Um, but that's not what we're worried about. But if we go back we see some kind of similarities. We see the, the, the knotted belt. We see a really almost like cinched waist that really kind of hugs. Although, right, this is armor instead of it being kind of like a belt or just whatever it is. Um, and then we have a lot of just flowing. And most importantly, we have the sleeves sleeves, the sleeves, the sleeves. Those sleeves are important because to me, the Blio really kind of starts giving us that. And granted, the Blio is also influenced in Norman fashion, I believe is influenced from Byzantine. Byzantine? I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong. So this is called a corsage. Um, I cannot find any modern version of this. Like, I think this was called a corsage in the past, and I think it was an incorrect viewing of the Blio. So the real blios from what we or what we gather is most likely like side laced, um, but these. But what people kind of thought it was at first. Actually, let's go back to. Actually, you know what? Why is this all happening, right? Why are, do why do we have all of these wrong interpretations? Why are these guys trying to do figure this all out? It's because of the Chartres Cap Cathedral in France. Um, so these are some of the images of Blios in that cathedral. Um, there's been a, like, they, a whole bunch of it got burned, but this was one of the few places that didn't. Um, and so when we look at it, we see them wearing Blios. There's a couple images right here as well of Blios, and this one's definitely from Cheskot Cathedral. I don't remember if this one is, to be honest. Um, and you can see stomach lines that are insinuating of closeness um like these are definitely wrinkles and again it's close to the chest so it's it's it, you can see your body right um and then we see these long long lines that are going down what people couldn't figure out or fashion historians could have figured out in the past was how this was being made if you looked at this in the past you might have thought you know what this looks like it's a totally different shirt and we do have some examples that possibly allude to that as well um and again these have been debates for decades i cannot answer this for you but from what um i've read more modernly the assumption is that the this is just one piece but this has the side lacing to create this effect and then is constructed well enough so that you can get these at the back but if we look back at here, we can see the thought processes of what's been going on. So we have this corsage. I mean, look at all this beautiful, like, ribbing and stuff. I do think that this is 
inspiring um partially these armor bits at the the here and two we see on the nos armor these almost like mirroring the rouging the pleats of like these little wrinkles or whatever you want to call them of the blio um except really hardy really armor like um and so this is Queen Matilda. Um, this is from a 1930s drawing. So this is, a, to us, an old source, but it's too new for it to be a first account, right? Um, but this is all over the net. This is all over the internet. Queen Matilda kind of gets thrown around as the Norman kind of like fashion icon. And yet all of these images are just possibilities. When you read them, they say, this is what we think, but we're not sure. This is closer to the era. This is closer to the era. I think this is what? This is this is from a manuscript of St. George and the Dragon. You see his blio, and look at that. You see a slit. Um, see a belt. See a little slit. And that, and, and very, very, you know, pretty breasts. <laughs> um, and this almost like if you were looking at it, it almost looks like a stomach piece, right? It looks like it's almost its own shirt and then a skirt. And then you compare that to what we have on the Knox and you see this little triangle piece that then comes out to be about, you know, I, I feel like this is just the fantasy version of what we were getting there. Um, and if you take off these, uh, the Knox greaves, sorry, you can see my underwear. Um, you can see as well um, that it's a shirt. And so my argument is that they, because of the head in being so well-crafted and so obviously built within the realities of our own world, like this is made in line with what we see in the real world unequivocally, and they took their time to make sure that it has accuracy to its construction. And so my argument is that, that they saw the Blio and that they knew they wanted to, to use it um, alongside the Henin for the Knox and took references within and created their own style with it. And the reason why I feel like that is because they took so much time to... Um, to get the hen in correctly, that they could have gotten the blio to be exactly as we kind of more modernly see it, but decided not to because they wanted to create something unique, but still mentioning and referencing something that is so iconic to medieval Renaissance and um, our like perceptions of it modernly. And so let's go back to the cathedral. Um, and again, these are, you, you see, a veil, you see these like V almost shaped kind of like really embroidered collars. You see a upper a higher collar right here. You see all of these different designs and you get an idea of why the Blio pod was a lot harder to figure out or like um for fashion historians and you can see these lines. And so people could not figure out why these lines existed, why these, because this is all tension, right? Um, this is signifying tension in the fabric. People couldn't figure out how they got this and this together. And so the assumption was, well, this is just showing that it's, a, it's definitely a vest. It's definitely a vest. You can actually see some of the, um, the cupping of the bosom. <laughs> That mirrors a lot of the way that the chest is cut in the women's clothing for the, the swordstresses in game. So let's go to them real fast. Um, you can see just that gorgeous little bit of like almost rouging, but it's it instead of it's it's made like an armor, right? Instead. But let's go back into it. Um and then you have the Blio sleeves. This is really the really big important one. They're also square cut, um, very similarly in the way that uh, the, um, <clears throat> the Knox ones are. What is different is that the, instead of having bunches 
Um, the sleeve for the Knox is two pieces of fabric. Um, so there might end up being a different sleeve somewhere else that I haven't found that actually just works better um, because the construction there is not similar. We can see side lacing on the, um, the Knox as well, but I believe it was to create what they think was a, like a corsage. I do think it's a low key in reference to it though, because look at how, um, so it's like half almost like armor construction half like Leo construction. Like, um, So it's side laced, and you can see that there's also two clasps to keep it up, to keep it up and like keep it, you know, like cinched and, and ready. So I, I think their construction methods was like in between kind of like theorizing about the blio and then also just making sure it's like an armor piece. Um, and I believe on the other side as well, it is also laced and clasped. Let me double check. Um, Okay, so no class, but it is side lace. Oh, no, no, same class, two class. So these are two pieces being conjoined at the, like, you're putting this on over this, this shirt. You have your belt, your greaves, and then you have your, your mantle part. Um, and this follows more in line with kind of our ideas of a blio was in the past. Or that there were blios that were, because uh, when you read it, you know, it's like, oh yeah, there was definitely multiple blios with, um, that were just two pieces. Um, and that's definitely a possibility. So it could be just that they specifically found blios that were, they're closer to what they wanted, and that's what they took as well. So this is 12th century for sure. So you see decadent collar rouging around the chest area again i really really think that chest design from uh for the swordstresses and the the knock the maidens are really trying to mirror this um because especially too because with fantasy armor like there's no armor for women where their breasts are being held like that um that's just not that's just a fantasy thing for sure um, even this outfit, you see this little, like, mantle really reminds me of the Knox monk hood, um, instead of it being, except it's just not going from the top, right? Um, and then you see this, this blio, and the designs, too, look at that, you really kind of get a, a similar sense to what you're seeing elsewhere. And also on the mantle part, the little, like, Taller area, you have this very similar design right here. And let's get into our next stuff. Yeah, let's go into their neckwear. Um, so the neckwear is very interesting. So my first thought with the neckwear was that they um that it was mostly ecclesiastical and then just very fantastical when you could see where it's being sewn you can see that this is kind of supposed to be there to protect the neck maybe even keep the um maybe even keep this kind of together um but you know i'm not sure about that when i also too if you switch to if you switch to the knox armor you'll see this little clasp that's on this metal piece. And there we go. So what I think that is, is a gorget. Um, a gorget has two meanings. The gorget used to be um, just what is basically like the the chin strap like covering fab linen covering for for women in the 13th century 12th century um and then in the 15th century it became a more protective it came to represent a protective um armor 
So we can kind of come up with a couple of reasons as to why the developers decided to use the Henan as the signifier of the Nox Swordstress and the Nox Nightmaiden. Uh, one of them, I think, is a subversion of the historical period that it comes from. Um, the perception of the Henan by clergy was very negative. It was too um, garish. It was too huge. Um, and uh, for some, it was too masculine. Uh, the Henan was seen as a horned item. So horns had a lot of connotations, not only to the devil, which was definitely a reason why they didn't like it, but also to animals. And at this time, women are definitely supposed to not be <laughs> animalistic in any ways. That's definitely seen as barbarous. Um, or man and mannish, right? And so again, in, you know, in history, it's very much the dress that you're wearing defines your gender um, in a very different way that we look at things modernly because our fashion, we have a we have different conceptions of gender now. Um, but with the Knox Maiden and the Swordstress, what's so brilliant about them having henans is that they are a matriarchal clergy. Um, they are the high, uh, the maiden is the highest ranked, um, official, um, outside of probably, I'm going to guess, you know, whoever the, the Lord of Night's supposed to end up being, maybe even, um, the big ladies that are, that are sitting, maybe they were leaders, who knows, right? Um, but you get a really brilliant subversion of what we looked at in the, the, it's actually almost like a, it's almost as if it's being enforcing that, right? Because the, the maiden and, and the source just are perceptibly evil to a lot of people. I think one of the reasons why we have the henan on the, the sword stress and the, the maiden is because of how common this image is. Um, and if we, just like the Blio, um, it is an image, it's something that's within our iconography in high fantasy. Um, we, when we think of the Renaissance, if you say medieval times, people are going to think of this singular princess uh, hat, you know, and they'll call it a princess hat, right? You can go to Disneyland and you can get this exact hat. Um, and it's, it's a one, it's, you know, it's just one piece. Um, and we know now most likely these were not one pieces at all. Um, so I think there's a commonality in the language that's, uh, the visual language, um, that is being used. So because this is, defines our perceptions of the medieval past, we get the, the Knox then utilizing that imagery as mysterious figures who influence the lands between culture. And when we compare that or a look at that with the way that the Blio has been historically seen as well, I think we get a confirmation in their desire to subvert and utilize these very common um, conceptions of, of the past, these common um, items that we see in our recreations of the past and our, our retellings of the past and in our, you know, our own fantas fantasy settings. Um, we see them using that visual language on the knots. Um, and it's the same for the Blio. The Blio um, becomes this feminine um, defining item, especially after the pre-Raphaelite era. Um, and so then you see it, you know, people call it the, the, the Lord of the Rings dress, right? Um, and so we have it so, so, so synonymous with a mythical past. I think there's something to be said about the myths that we know now are debunked, but still permeate our culture and the myths surrounding the Knox, um, Swartuses, the maidens and their culture. Um, there's a lot of layering going on there. And again, part of my reason why I think this is because they spent so much time on getting the construction right of these garments in terms of like what they realistically would have been. 
um, they would have been going through all these sources. They would have been checking these fashion books. They would have been checking um, the construction methods experts in these fields. Um, they wouldn't have gotten to the level of design that they did with these costumes without it. And that's my big argument, that they were actively aware of the debates that were going on in fashion history with the Blio, with the, with the Henin, and that informing their use for the Knox. Um, and again, even just using something that is actually unisex in that time period to then have it be unisex. I mean, that, just little things like that. It, it's so carefully crafted um, that it's hard to deny to me that they took the time to research this. So why did they combine parts of the Blio with parts of ecclesiastical dress with a henin? with a and a double head in, or, or excuse me what they call it the maiden twin crown because the knocks are meant to have impact on multiple cultures in the lands between we're talking this area this area this area um salia <laughs> all of lyurnia basically definitely some areas here in Lindau. Um, their, their influence is really felt in a lot of places, very similarly to the Normans. Um, and so it makes sense for you to reinterpret common ideas and images and fashions of the past and combine them together to create something that can feasibly connect aesthetically to the rest of the characters, the cultures in the game. So what do I mean by that? So let's do some, let's do some, some, some fashion built. Oh, let me get rid of my, <laughs> my Prince of Desta. This is who I run with usually. It's like who I do multiplayer. And like, I have just like a crap load of stuff on. Um, so we have with the Night Maiden and Twin crowns and the Knight's Fortress crowns, and also the, um, and we'll get into them in a little bit after um, the Priestess crown, the Priestess veil, that's for the one that's in the Church of Vows. Um, there's a lot of eye coverings, and we see that not only in other feasibly Noxian people like Lusat and Azur. Um, yeah, let me get a look closer. Yeah, so there's there's these this motif of eye coverings um, that they need to connect to, um, and we see that also in the Great Hood. Um, it's not as like an exact eye covering, but I still think the motif is there. Um, we have that with the Hyma Glenstone crown, the Herodas Glenstone crown. We have a lot of eye coverings. We have that with with a lot of other people too, um, but I. I do believe that it was it was necessary for them to connect them. Um, and we also have a, and if we're going back to the Hennens, um, a visual connective tissue to Renala. Um, you know, I don't think her, her hat is still out in the open, like out for sure what the inspiration is. I'm still thinking the Amino, Yoshitaka Amino drawing, um, but I'm also here for the microsure theory. Um, it also could just be multiple. I also kind of think it's multiple pieces, which is why I think it might be influenced by the Henin or at least alluded to that aesthetically design wise. Yeah, this is kind of, this is taking you to similar places. I mean, even the, the applique, it reeks of, if you were kind of going like, well, that's kind of, kind of close to the knots. <clears throat> But again, she's queen. Um, she's more of the Gothic era, so it makes sense for her to be even more um, more gold. Um, and also, too, like they're of the night. There's there's so many other li different little levels. Um, 
to go with that. Um, but they do have, you know, these subtle gold-ish bands. They're almost like bronze almost. Um, and I just think that really adds to it. We also have with the oval part, again, let's go back to, um, I almost wonder if there's a little bit of similarities in the, the, the eyepiece that's hanging down in that. Oh, and even with the, the dress, right? We have these long sleeves that are the, uh, Leo sleeves, but then we also, uh, and they're also monastic, right? They also connect it. But then we also have these ones that are kind of a later date. Um, but also, I do, I wouldn't be surprised if this is Norman influenced these clothes. Um, they resemble a lot of the um, Norman fashion I did see that's a little bit more um, just kind of like middle class. Um, and part of the reason why that is, I think that is a well is because we do have gores on here. Um, so gores are pan triangular panels that um, come out to give you that shape. Um, and um, the woman who has the YouTube uh, Harpy and Tag, I need to figure out her name, um, she talks about gores in her 12th Norman, century Norman fashion and, and it being a part of figuring out um, if it's that, if it's, that, if it's from that era. Um, but again, you also, it's just so many little things. You get these kind, again, you have like an, um, a really decorated collar just like them. Um, so there's a visual language, I would argue, that's similar. Um, and even then, going back to the Henan, um, let me switch this around. Uh, again, going back to the Henan again, um, if we go back to the point of the Henan possibly being co coming from setting off the Lyra pipe of a hood, um, I just think that's so fascinating because then obviously we have the, um, the astrologer's hood with the Lyra pipe. We have the, um, we have all of the, uh, academic dress of the Lucarians, of the Carians, the right Lucarians, um, all of they that have the Lyra pipe. So I just love that there's that little bit of tidbit. Um, and, you know, even from a story perspective, we can take this idea of the Henan, the Henan being something that's seen as wrong, sinful, um, evil, devilish in the eyes of the clergy, now being subverted to be this symbol of this rebellious, but yet monastic group is brilliant. It's it's really brilliant. There's layers. And I, I, it really, to me, confirms how much they are thinking about the connections of the fashion, the creation of the fashion, the textiles that they're choosing, the designs that they're choosing um, in order to, sup not supplement, but in order to bolster what they already have created story-wise. What can we conclude from, from this whole, whole video? Um, I think ultimately um, the game developers are very aware of clothing construction. They are aware of the movement of textiles and clothing across history and how that gets reflected through the cultures and shows the wars and intermingling and, and violence and, and, um, change that happens throughout time and throughout these eras that they're generally focusing on. So we're talking about medieval period. We're talking about, you know, anywhere, anywhere from, <clears throat> especially if we're concerning with the Knox, you know, anywhere from like the 11th century to, to the, the 15th century, um, in terms of references. Um, and I don't, and I think that there is a purposeful layering of the, various references they are making. Um, they wanted, I think, a very fantastical outfit. This is very high fantasy, but based in images, thoughts, and ideas that have existed and 
conceptions of like clothing production that have existed within fashion history and with fashion historians and um, people who make um, recreations of, of, of clothing. Uh, Cause there's a lot of people who do that. That's, it's just so cool. Um, I think that they chose the Henin, the double horned Henin to symbolize a lot of this subversion. These uh, very uh, matriarchal society has, um, they wanted to use elements that are very, reminiscent of a damsel in distress um the blio and the 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 head in and change it and subvert it to something that was scary and honestly that fits more of the roles that it was perceived to have in the past because it was devilish it was it was animalistic it was like you know it was just so also just like soup like gaudy and superfluous right that was like why are you gonna put all this on your head but we see how also this affects the rest of fashion later in history and we continue to have wildly cool headpieces that m mix wimples and quaffs and headpieces and hair pieces together um so i think while it's a little bit different from the way that they did the Karians, because again, the Karians also, like, or like the Riley Karian outfits, it's like, there's a lot of mixing of eras, but not quite. Actually, no, it is the same. Never mind. Ignore that. Um, it is done in the same way, of fame, same vein as the way they mixed eras for the Riley Karian's fashion. Um, so hopefully you enjoyed that. If you have better references, let me know. Maybe this is just, you know, a step in the right direction for us figuring out what are better representations or better understandings of what are the references for the knots. Um, and we'll be back <clears throat> with one sooner. We have one. I want to do one more before the end of February is over. Um, I think that one's going to be a lot shorter. Uh, anyways, I hope you all enjoyed. And I'll see you on the next episode. Bye.